This is Duke University. Uh, it's amusing to have a, an introduction as the moderator um, because the, you know, the real message is I'm not the subject matter expert. Uh, I'm just here to make sure that we make, um, to the extent that I can, the best possible uh, use of our time. First of all, welcome to all of you. And um, as um, this seminar also is uh, profoundly interesting to me, my thanks to um, the Energy Hub and to you know, the, the, the Canadian Studies Program, to the, the, um, the Stanford, to Fuqua, um, and, and the other elements, um, and including the uh, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, which have all, in one way or another, uh, contributed uh, to um, the, this effort and, and, and which have collectively made this series of seminars possible. We are very, very fortunate uh, to have with us today um, um, three individuals who are all deeply knowledgeable about what is happening in Mexico virtually as we speak. Um, uh, and it is um, significant, you know, what's going on there right now is significant in, in, in ways that few other um, reform efforts in the hemisphere are anywhere in the hemisphere. Now, to get us started, I thought I'd make just a couple of very brief points. Um, uh, if you will, from the, the, the point of view of an American policymaker until relatively recently. A first point. Latin America, and indeed the Western Hemisphere, is, is more important today to the United States than it has ever been. Most of you, particularly if you follow presidential politics in the United States, understand that you know we have issues involving immigration or counter narcotics um, and, and there are you know other challenges if you will um, to our um, our agenda within the hemisphere we often don't grasp I think um, fully how economically interdependent um, the hemisphere now is but one small indication 42 to 43 percent of all U.S. exports go to the Western Hemisphere. Vastly more um, than go to China or Russia or a whole series of other countries. Vastly more. So our economic relationship with the Western Hemisphere, particularly with our NAFTA partners, is of increasingly central importance for um, the well-being of the United States um, uh, writ large. It is important to understand, too, that that relationship is growing and has been growing over time. And what does that mean? I cite just two other statistics. Every billion dollars of new exports in goods generate approximately 6,000 jobs. Parenthetically, what is it we have heard um, most frequently about the current um, somewhat anemic recovery? That it is a jobless recovery. Where are new jobs going to be generated? I'm not the only one who, tell, who will tell you in the export sector. Every billion dollars of new export, uh, exports of services, apparently, according to the, the um, US Trade Representative's office, generates approximately 4,500 jobs. So uh, not, not only in the aggregate, not only over time, but right now, right now, the growth of trade within the hemisphere is of central importance to us. Second point, or second if you will, ahead of energy. Um, notwithstanding the fact that um, uh, much of the public debate in the United States revolves around um, uh, the, the challenges that attend our energy relationship uh, or relationships with the Middle East, in point of fact, the Western Hemisphere is in that area too considerably more important to us than our relations, um, energy relationships um, um, in the Middle East. The largest foreign supplier of petroleum to the United States is Canada. 
But Mexico has often been the second largest supplier, is always in the top five, as is Venezuela. And in recent years, both Colombia and Ecuador have also figured in the top 10 or so um, uh, suppliers. Typically, only Saudi Arabia, the countries in the Middle East, um, figures in the top five. Only Saudi Arabia. So the, um, uh, the path, if you will, toward um, either national or hemispheric energy independence clearly requires um, you know, a collective effort in the Western Hemisphere. What's going on in Mexico, and I'm just going to touch on this very briefly because our, our, our uh, invited panelists today are, are, are much more knowledgeable than I am. What's going on in Mex Mexico today is uh, tremendously important and, and indeed precedent setting. There has been a state monopoly of energy resources in Mexico since 1938, a constitutional prohibition on foreign participation since 1940, right? Is that something along those lines? Um, until, you know, if, if one might say the last 10 years, perhaps, um, while there were inefficiencies, production in Mexico um, uh, really depended on access to, if you will, easily extractable oil. Um, and um, the resources were abundant. Mexico figured among our, our top suppliers. And the income from that oil um, was and still is um, uh, an important source um, for uh, revenue to the government. In recent years, um, both the perceived uh, uh, both reserves have dropped, production has dropped, and projections for the future, if there is not an effort to substantially increase um, uh, the uh, capitalization, the, the, the development of uh, tight oil, either um, you know, uh, deep water oil or shale oil, the projections for the future for Mexico are pretty grim. Consequently, all the major parties in Mexico have begun to entertain and have presented um, uh, projects, if, for those of you who speak uh, Spanish, something we might call it, uh, you know, ante proyecto de ley, you know, um, where either for uh, an overhaul of regulations governing foreign participation uh, um, and, uh, and or even an, an overhaul of the Constitution. And we have asked our three guests uh, today uh, to help us understand what is going on. After 80 years, effectively, uh, it appears, it appears that that Mexico is on the verge of breaking with its own traditions. And, um, uh, and certainly there appears to be a consensus within Mexico that something has to be done. And this is very, very important. It's important to Mexico, it's important to us, it's important to the region. Um, we have with us today um, uh, Duncan Wood, the, uh, the director of the Mexico program at the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, Ernesto Marcos, Formerly the uh, chief financial officer of Pemex, the state oil company in Mexico, um, now the head of his own consultancy, but a, a widely known and, and, and frequently cited expert on the energy sector. And Juan Pardinas, the head of the um, Institute on Competitiveness and the um, uh, principal author of an immense study, <laughs> and immensely important. It's not only big, it's terrific. Uh, um, on uh, uh, competitiveness and, and in bringing Mexico into the new global um, uh, energy order. Uh, so with that, with that preamble, and I, I still have lots of questions left over from my morning session, uh, I'm going to ask Duncan to, to begin our, uh, our, our time here um, with kind of an overview of the political situation, the context in which uh, these reforms are, are being considered. Each will speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to open the floor to questions. And we really want um, uh, all of you uh, to participate in this discussion, if not every single one of you, a significant number of you. So we'll try to, 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 um, to, to save as much time as we can for our dialogue. Thanks very much. And I'm going to ask you to hold this, because they're going to try to record you, even though um, our remarks are not being echoed. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Um, I'm a recovering academic, 
Um, and I was a professor for 17 years, and I just got out in December, and I got this terrific job at the Wilson Center in Washington, where I get to do kind of academic stuff without having to teach. And then I discovered that I miss teaching. And but it's kind of like a weird, sick addiction, you know? It's, it's like, you know, I've become you know, codependent with, with students. And uh, one of the lovely things about the job that I had in Mexico, where I was a professor and director of program at the, at the, uh, the TAM, which is a small private university, in the uh, southwest of the city, is that I got to be the professor of uh, 17 generations, or 17 years of students, and I find them now all over the world. There's a huge cohort of them, a little mafia of Itamitas, they call them, in Washington, D.C. And even when I come to a place like Duke, there's somebody over there who's one of my former students. And I swear it's a government plot to follow me and to make sure I'm not saying anything wrong. But anyway, great pleasure to be here. I like being in the classroom setting. And uh, as Patrick said, you know, we, we've been asked to speak for a sort of 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to try to talk for 10 minutes because what we discovered in the previous session was that there were lots of questions afterwards. Okay? So let's try to, to leave it as open as possible. Um, and the first thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, you guys are, all know something about energy. You guys uh, have an interest in energy. Where would you say the biggest bright spot in the hemisphere is right now for energy? Where's the biggest upside, would you say? Right here, exactly, the United States. And that's, that's generally what people say. Five years ago, people said Brazil, right? And I think that they're allergic to the speech already. I think. <laughs> the mention of Brazil. Um, you know, the fact is, is that the upside in the United States is, is already happened, doesn't it? We're in the middle of it. We're seeing this huge upswing in production. Everything good is happening here. Brazil, five years ago, everything seems to be kind of on hold right now as the government and the national oil company tries to readjust to the realities of a changing legal framework and trying to say, well, what is it that we do now? Whereas, you know, they've discovered all this oil in Brazil in recent years, they're finding their capacity to extract the oil limited by the particular kind of uh, leg uh, legal arrangements that they've put in place. I would say that right now there are two countries which actually show the biggest potential upside, and that's Mexico and Venezuela. Because there we're about to see in Mexico a very, very big change. In Venezuela, we're waiting to see when the change happens. But when that change happens, it'll be a big, big upside as well. Now, seeing as we're focusing on Mexico, as Patrick said already, since 1938, or in fact since 1940 when the legislation was actually about the constitutional change was, was made in Mexico, we've lived in a, a, an oil and gas sector uh, which is essentially governed by one company, uh, Pemex, the national oil company. And the national oil company is a matter of national pride in Mexico. It is seen as being a symbol of national sovereignty. Um, at various points in its history, it's achieved huge successes. Um, in particular, the discovery of a super, super giant field in the Gulf of Mexico in the 1970s called Camperel. Does anybody here know the story of Camperel, the, the oil field? At one time, it was the second largest oil field in the world. And you say, well, Pe Pemex did a great job in discovering that. The, the true story of Camperel was that, in fact, there was a fisherman. Okay, called Rudasindo Sacantarev, who goes out in his fishing boat, he keeps coming back in and saying, look, there's oil all over my nets. This is really pissing me off. So he goes to the Pemex office and he says, listen, you guys, you've got a leak out there in the Gulf of Mexico. And they say, we don't have an oil well. He says, go and check it out. So they go out there and they discover the world's second largest oil field. Okay? Entirely by accident. That, that's brilliant. I mean, that's real sort of, you know, national monopoly uh, efficiency going on there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and the great thing about this discovery is that, you know, they say to this, this, one, this lovely fisherman who discovered it for them, they say, you know what, you discovered it, so we're going to name the field after you. And he said, what about having 1% of the profits? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't, they don't even buy any nets. I mean, you know, this is a pretty bad deal for this guy. But anyway, thanks to the discovery of Pantarell, Pemex and Mexico as an oil-producing nation become major, major oil producers. You know, this is an oil field that at its, at its peak produced over two million barrels a day. That's an extraordinary amount of oil from one oil field. National oil production in, uh, in 2004 went up to 3.4 million barrels a day before declining very, very rapidly to today where we're around 2.55 million barrels a day. And Juan and Ernesto will talk more about what that loss, loss production means. In 2008, the government of Felipe Calderón tried to enact a, a, an energy reform that would increase private participation in the sector, but they were pushed back 
by opposition from the opposition parties, by public opinion, and eventually passed a piece of energy, legis energy reform legislation, which is very, very disappointing. You know, I've called it una reforma asfixiada, a strangled reform, because that's really what it was. It didn't do very much to get air into the system. It didn't do very much to shake up the oil and gas sector. But one thing that did happen in 2008 was that people began to talk about the problems of the oil and gas industry in Mexico and began to understand that whereas Pemex is a matter of national pride, whereas oil is so intimately associated with national identity that you can't separate the two, the fact is that Mexico was in trouble. And the future was not particularly rosy. And this idea gradually took hold in the minds of Mexicans, in particular in the minds of the political elite. In 2008, uh, a significant number of politicians refused to accept there was a problem. But beginning in 2011, as we led up to the uh, presidential election campaigns of 2012, the election of, two, of July 2012, the issue of reforming the energy sector became a priority in each of the major parties' platforms. Each of the three major parties recognized that there was something wrong and we needed to do something about it. The guy who won the election in July of 2012 is Enrique Peña Nieto, the president of Mexico. And his party, the PRI party, the, the Revolutionary Institutional Party, is still a brilliant name, but you can, you can be revolutionary and institutional. <laughs> the, the, only, the only party in the world that had a better name, I think, was a, was a Canadian political party, which has now changed the name. It's now called the Conservatives, but they used to be called the Progressive Conservatives. And I thought, that's really cool. You can be conservative, but progressive. Progressive, but conservative. I like that. That's what you know, once they're forced to back. Now, the PRI party is the party that, that ruled Mexico for 71 years. Um, they lost the election in 2000, uh, were out of power for 12 years, but they come back on a wave of optimism that they're the party that can fix many of Mexico's problems. In part, they were, they were responsible for Mexico's problems as well when they were in power, but they've come back and people, Mexican people believe that this is a party that can essentially fix many of the things that needed to be done. And the reason why is because they saw what happened when the PRI was out of power. For 12 years, the center-right party, the PAN, under the leadership of Vicente Fox, as president first of all, and Felipe Calderón, failed to enact the structural reforms that were needed, not just in energy, but across the board, structural reforms of the economy and the political system. Now, in part, the responsibility for that lies with the, the PAN party and with the presidents, Fox and Calderón, who were unable to really work with the Congress to get legislative uh, progress. Part of the blame really lies with the opposition parties in that time, the PRI and the PRD, the left-wing party. And in particular, the PRI, we have to look at the PRI, the PRI played a classic game while it was out of power of blocking every major legislative uh, advance. And for a while, you know, when I was living there, I, as a political scientist, I looked at it and I said, well, you know, this is part of democracy growing up, isn't it? You know, we've got uh, gridlock in Washington, we've got gridlock in Mexico City. This is all part of the normal to and fro of democracy. But then, when Enrique Peña Nieto and the, and the PRI came back into power in July of last year, pretty much everything changed. Everything changed in a very, very big way. There's a very long transition period in Mexico between the election and the president taking power. And so it, it was not until December of last year when he actually entered office. And on the first day that he entered office, he announced something called the Pacto por México. And the Pacto por México is a political negotiating mechanism and agreement between the three main parties, where they've agreed on 95 issues where they have reached a consensus, and that's what the legislative program is going to be over the next few years. It's an extraordinary thing. And in the 10 months since then, they have passed already four major structural reforms. That's four more than were passed in the past 12 years. They've passed structural reforms in labor, education, telecoms, and finance. They've presented the energy reform, which will be voted on very soon. And they've also presented a fiscal reform, which will shake up the, com the country's taxation system. This is a period of extraordinary change extraordinary progress in the Mexican Congress. The country has the opportunity now to move ahead in a way that it hasn't done for the past 12, in fact, 15 years since the PRI not only lost the, uh, the presidency in 2000, but they lost control of the Congress in 1997. And that brings us to energy reform. The energy reform is one of the issues where there was some consensus, and as Ernesto will, will tell you later on, there were issues there that all three of the parties were able to agree on. In particular, strengthening the national oil company was seen as being a very, very important issue. But there wasn't agreement amongst the three major parties on the question of increasing private participation in the sector. And that's what the government is proposing at this point. They're proposing a constitutional change, and a particularly brilliant constitutional change, because what they're doing is they're using the exact wording of the 1940 constitutional change 
and they're going to bring it back into, uh, in, in, into, into play today. And the reason why they're doing that is because they can now appeal to Mexican political sensitivities. Mexicans who say, look, you know what, you're, you're changing everything, you're getting rid of our <coughs> fine heritage, our, our political culture of controlling oil. And they think, no, we're going back to the original wording of what President Lazaro Cárdenas, in 1938, what he wanted to do to the oil sector. What does that involve? That involves, essentially, allowing for production sharing and profit sharing deals between private companies and foreign companies and the government. Maybe in conjunction with Pemex, maybe not. Pemex will now have to compete for oil contracts in, in Mexico. That's an extraordinary change. Now that's the legislation to, to change the Constitution, to change Articles 27 and 28 of the Constitution that's currently on the table. There will then be secondary legislation that has to be presented. And that secondary legislation will sort of define exactly what we mean by either production sharing or profit sharing deals. And we can, we can, we can enter into that in, in the Q&A afterwards. But the government has presented this in such a way that they've pulled the, the rug out from underneath the feet of many of those people who would oppose the reform. It doesn't mean they're not going to oppose it. The centre-right party has basically said, yeah, okay, it's not exactly the reform that we would have wanted, but we're on board. The mm -hmm. left-wing party, the PRD, said there's no way we can accept this. In particular because the eminence Grise, the intellectual leader of the, uh, of the left on, uh, on energy issues, is a man called Potemo Cardenas, the son of Lazaro Cardenas, the guy who nationalized the, the industry. And he said, you know, you're using the words that my, that my father used. Well, I'm telling you, you're abusing that, those words, you're, you're abusing that, uh, that legacy of his. That's not what he wanted to do at all. The problem is, it's very difficult to, to say that when you're actually using the exact words that he approved. But they promised to have uh, major uh, manifestations, manifestations, protests. Um, sometimes I forget which language I'm using. Um, protests in, in, in Mexico City and across the country. And they promised to hold a, re uh, a referendum in 2015. And the referendum will call for the, the Congress to repeal any constitutional change that takes place in this session of Congress. Whether or not that's legally viable is another question. It will probably have to go to the courts to work it out. But they promised to protest it. But then the government pulled an absolute brilliant masterstroke. After the energy reform, they presented a fiscal reform, a taxation reform. And that taxation reform was designed to placate the left. Instead of going after the poorer sections of society, which everybody thought they were going to do by putting value-added tax on the food and medicine, they decided to go after the middle classes, raising taxes on the middle classes, adding value-added tax to mortgages, to tuition payments, etc., things that will really hit the middle classes, and to bring in a capital gains tax. Now, the, whether that's a very effective taxation strategy is not really the question right now. Politically, it makes a lot of sense. Because the left can now, can, can not say the government's working against the poorer people. Look, they're, 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 they're stealing the oil from Mexicans and giving it to foreigners, and they're gonna tax the poor as well. Now the leftist has to say, well, we're on board with this fiscal reform. So the whole project of the Pacto por México, which was this negotiating mechanism, is still in play. Everybody's in the deal. And as Ernesto will probably tell you in a, in, a, in a second, this means that when the constitutional change is passed in the Congress, the left-wing party will be able to come back and play a role in negotiating the secondary legislation as well. Which means that from a political point of view, everybody becomes a stakeholder. And that's one of the extraordinary things, and I'll close with this. The lessons that we can learn from Mexico today are that there is a way that you can actually make your political system work even under democratic conditions. You know, <laughs> that I have it with in Washington. Oh my God! You know, these are guys who really just do not seem to find a, a way of, of working together at all. Some of you may have seen the story in Slate that was circulated recently about who follows whom on Twitter. Do you see this? Republicans follow Republicans on Twitter, Democrats follow Democrats on Twitter, and they don't read each other's Twitter feeds. I mean, they, they have no clue what's going on. Never the twain shall meet in, in, in American politics. That's not the case in Mexico. We have a kind of cohabitation and a, a form of political negotiation that makes so many things possible that were impossible even a year ago. With that, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> we're going to turn now to uh, Dr. Ernesto Marcos, um, who has an extraordinarily um, long um, uh, curriculum. And I'll just emphasize again that in addition to his um, recent role as an advisor to I don't know how many companies and the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, etc. He was for six years the chief financial officer of Pemex. And he will give us 
yet another perspective on this challenge. I would add, you know, one one further point, and some of you know, um, I've worked around um, Latin America. I worked around Latin America as a diplomat for many years, everywhere except practically in in Mexico. And one of the things that strikes me as we have this conversation is the degree to which Mexico is on the verge of breaking away from a trend that we see as um, in the ascendancy elsewhere in the hemisphere, and that is in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in a number of other places, we are seeing you know, um, uh, governments embrace, again, resource nationalism. Mexico did that a long time ago, but, but now appears ready to, to at least consider substantial change. Well, with that, yes, thank you. It's difficult to speak after Duncan. <laughs> uh, he's uh, most recently uh, you know, a professor. I was trying to remember when was the last time I gave a class, and uh, I have to recognize it was more than 35 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please uh, you know, allow me to, to uh, try to uh, expand on the issues that, uh, that Duncan uh, brought in. Uh, the first thing that, that I think we have to uh, understand is that uh, the oil and gas sector is very important for the Mexican economy. Uh, it represents uh, uh, around 15% of total export. And Mexico, by the way, is one of the most open economies in the world after 18 years of NAFTA. Uh, if you sum uh, import <coughs> plus exports, this represents over 60% of GDP. So we are a very, a very open economy. And uh, uh, the, the energy sector, although it is uh, uh, not, that, not that important as it used, uh, as it used to be, uh, the Mexican government is highly dependent on the fiscal revenues from Pemex. Uh, Pemex contributes with uh, something between 35 and 40% of the total fiscal revenues of, of Mexico. It is true that uh, we have not done our job in, uh, in, in taxing uh, the, the economy more efficiently. The tax, uh, the tax take uh, of, the, of, the, of the government not considering oil is around 10%, the lowest in the OECD uh, club. Uh, so we are highly dependent on, uh, on oil. And that is uh, one uh, clear reason why uh, oil and gas reform uh, or energy reform is, is required. The, the government has uh, become so dependent on, uh, on fiscal revenues that now that Pemex uh, does not have the traditional easy and cheap oil to extract uh, after Cantarell uh, has gone sour, uh, th there is no other way of finding additional resources from natural, uh, from the exploitation of natural resources, but to revive taxes on, uh, on other minerals, which are also uh, belong to the nation according to our constitution, and to, to bring in new operators, uh, international oil companies, operators in the, tech, in the uh, shale, gas, and oil uh, uh, industry to, to help produce more uh, oil and gas, but, but, but also uh, uh, generate the, the competitiveness that the economy uh, needs. Let me, let me just say uh, there are so many issues that, that have to be covered that uh, uh, oil and gas has, uh, has dropped in Mexico around 25%. Uh, the US has uh, re recorded in the last five years a 25% increase in the production of oil. And by the way, I'm, I'm really uh, surprised by the fact that uh, in America, in the US, you are not so conscious of the revolution that the shale gas, the uh, shale gas and oil uh, uh, evolution has uh, mean, means for the country. You, are, you, are, you now have the lowest uh, price of gas. Uh, this is the, the most efficient region in the world uh, in terms of production of energy. This is generating a reindustrialization in the country. You, you have many companies uh, from uh, all over the world bringing back uh, plants that were installed in China and, and they are coming back to the US. There are several Mexican companies that are already 
uh, installing their manufacturing plants in the US when the, the process was, uh, ha has al have always been the, the reverse. And this is because <coughs> uh, the, the not only uh, availability, but the price of gas uh, is significantly lower. Uh, if we have time, okay, we can explain later uh, why we don't even have the infrastructure to import the necessary gas uh, in the country. Let me just give you a figure. We are producing like 5.7 BCF of gas a day. We're importing 2.2 BCF uh, of gas a day. We're importing 50% of the total national consumption of gasoline. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this comes from the fact that uh, we have not been able to, in to invest in, in refineries uh, in the last uh, 35 years. In, 19, in the 70s, we, we built the last, uh, the last refinery. So <coughs> uh, uh, the, the country needs urgently a, a, a reform on the uh, energy sector. And I would, I would say that uh, the strategy now, I mean, the, 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 the fact that uh, we have to justify this, this reform comes not from an offensive uh, uh, strategy to make the best use of the opportunities that are uh, being generated by this uh, chain revolution. But it's a defensive strategy. If, if we don't want to lose our position, uh, our competitive position in terms of manufacturing exports, you must know that uh, Mexico exports more manufacturing goods than all of Latin America together. You know, the, the, the value of exports of manufacturing is uh, larger uh, in Mexico than, than in the rest of, uh, of the Latin America uh, uh, But going to the, uh, back to the uh, energy reform, there are three uh, main uh, columns for the reform, three main uh, axes. One is to strengthen the national oil company. Obviously, Pemex has been uh, all by itself <coughs> for the last 75 years, and they have done a good job. Uh, with some you know, block from Cantare. But uh, uh, even, even that, you know, we lost, uh, we lost one million barrels uh, a day of production from 3.5 to 2.5. But we have compensated more than one million barrels a day from new, uh, from new uh, developments, from, from new fields, from new oil fields, uh, because Cantare has lost, uh, has lost more than, more than 1.6 million barrels. So, you, you have to recognize that the company uh, is uh, uh, efficient enough to be able to, to operate uh, uh, under these difficult conditions. I don't know if you have heard about the theory of peak oil. Peak oil was uh, uh, invented by a Texan geologist back in the 50s. He anticipated that uh, the US would uh, reach a peak in the production of oil between, he said, between mid-60s and the, the mid-70s. Well, it just happened uh, that the peak of, of, the oil, of the oil production in the U.S. was exactly in 1970. So it was very, very precise. <coughs> and then the theory extended to the rest of the world, and uh, there are associations of, of peak oil, uh, especially uh, uh, by geologists and some other oil uh, professionals, that, that still today say that we will no longer be, we, we will not be able to, to extract more oil uh, and gas, uh, except for what, what is happening in the US on the chain, on the chain of reason. This is, this is why it is, it is so important. But then, uh, not if, if you strengthen Pemex, well, the, the left party, the PRD party, <coughs> uh, uh, has uh, defended the, the case that if you allow Pemex to operate efficiently without all the regulations that, that, that the government imposes on it, and if you lower the tax rate that, that uh, Pemex has to, has to continue, then everything can be solved because uh, Pemex will be able to do everything uh, at, at the same time. And that is uh, uh, not true at all. Uh, it would need, uh, Pemex would need to triple the $25 billion a year that, 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 that uh, uh, they are investing in, in order to cope with the most urgent requirements of the, of, of the sector. But then the, the right, the party to the right, PAN, who had uh, the government for the last 12 years, 
it was not, say, not able to, to uh, pass a reform that, that, that would be significant for the, for the sector, uh, is proposing concessions which uh, back in, in 1940 were prohibited uh, by, by Lazar Cárdenas. Lazar Cárdenas, as uh, Duncan said, uh, uh, having the Constitution, in Article 27 of the Constitution, uh, a, a provision to concessions, but the, but the uh, other contracts were allowed. <coughs> These were uh, closed back, uh, back in 1960 because there were some concessions that were given to international companies, a couple of US companies, uh, before the, uh, the, the nationalization of oil in, in 1938 that had not been able to, 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 to be canceled uh, at, at that time. So th they changed the constitution to allow the Pemex uh, officials to, to be able to, to renegotiate those uh, concessions. But uh, I'm sorry, going back to the, to the uh, idea that what we need uh, uh, today in Mexico is to open up uh, the oil sector for other private investors to participate. Uh, the areas of opportunity are deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, and this is something that the US territorial waters would have done very well. Uh, just to give you a, a figure, we have not produced one single barrel of oil from deep waters, uh, from, from deep water in, in, in our territorial waters. And <coughs> you know that in the US, uh, you're dealing around 160 or 170, uh, 170 wells per year. There are uh, dozens of companies operating uh, in the world, and that has allowed uh, the US to, to maintain a, a high level of production. The other area of opportunity is shale. Uh, shale, gas, and oil. Uh, we share some of the geological conditions uh, that, that you have in, in, uh, in North America, the same, the same continent. Uh, but we have not been able to, to uh, exploit those uh, resources because the monopoly cannot operate uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, kind of, of uh, uh, very, very costly and very difficult uh, uh, reservoirs. Uh, somebody said that asking Pemex to exploit shale gas is like feeding an elephant uh, with ants but only allowing them to use Chinese uh, <laughs> that, That's how uh, on feet uh, Pemex can be to, to, to be able to develop the uh, Well, I, I, uh, I finish with uh, one, uh, one more reflection. It's, it is that uh, not only the political conditions are, are set to allow for these very radical changes uh, in, our, in our legal regime, and particularly in oil, uh, but it is, it is also uh, the need that, uh, that we have uh, for additional production uh, for, for our own national uh, requirements, and the, and the fact that the US might become uh, independent uh, in oil, because the peak oil theory now applies to demand. Uh, demand is not going to grow in, in, in the US in the foreseeable future because of uh, all the efficiency uh, measures that have uh, taken place. So you have increasing production and, 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 no, uh, and no increase or even a decline in consumption. Uh, if, we, if we don't uh, join the North American revolution in this, in this case, uh, we will suffer the problem of competitiveness and that's what one uh, will have to address. And, and, um, and, and before one begins, you know, I thought I'd just add <coughs> one more, you know, little nugget for you. And that is, though I think we haven't yet mentioned it, <coughs> while we emphasize that um, Pemex is of, uh, of central importance to Mexico, while the sense of sovereignty is acknowledged as, as tremendously important. In, in simple economic terms, it is also, I think, useful to remember um, uh, and to note, if you are not aware of it, that the government of Mexico depends on Pemex, that is to say, oil revenue, for up to 40% of the na national budget. So as we think about what it means to, um, to reform this sector, we need to keep that in mind. The, it, it is terribly important that Mexico find a way to continue to generate the revenues on which the, the national government depends. 
but also terribly risky um, to um, muck about in an area that is producing still, notwithstanding the decline in production, that is still generating that much revenue for the government. Go on. Thank you, <coughs> Patrick. Uh, following up Patrick's argument, if, if in the U.S. you had a Pemex, you would have a balanced budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, a, a key issue. <laughs> 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 That's how <laughs> important it is. Uh, I, I recently heard a, a saying that a country that polarizes politically stagnates economically. And it, that says a lot about uh, Mexican recent history. We have a competitive democracy for the last close to 15 years. And those 15 years, we have stagnated and blocked relevant reforms. Uh, I, I write op-eds in, in a Mexican newspaper, and, and I write about public policy. And sometimes I felt tempted to publish the same article I published like three years ago, because nothing really changed. I could just change a few things here and there, and it will be still as current as the morning newspaper. I never did, by the way. But now you have to adjust uh, the, the things uh, that I write almost by minute, because things are changing so fast. We, we did not reform for 15 years. And what we didn't do in those 15 years, we're trying to achieve it in 12 months. It, the, the amount of traffic of uh, reforms in the Congress is so bad that the demonstrators against reforms have to fight over the best spot where to demonstrate <laughs> against either education reform or energy reform. And all this is happening as, as, as we speak. So let me put you a picture of how, what Pemex is for, for the ordinary uh, Mexican. I don't know how many options of uh, gas stations you have to fill your car if, for, for the people that come in car to the university. Maybe three, four different uh, gas brands. Ten. 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 Well, for. 70 years, Mexicans had just one option to fill their gas tank. That's Pemex. Here in the US, well, gas prices are associated with oil. Well, that makes economic sense. It's like guacamole prices associated with avocado prices. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Mexico, no, it's different. Gasoline prices depends on a poor guy which tries to remain anonymous in the Ministry of Finance because he's the one responsible to raise prices according to the political circumstances or the financial circumstances. Mexico is the only country that subsidizes uh, gasoline in the OECD. We spend more money subsidizing gasoline than fighting poverty. I think one of the best fiscal reforms we could ever have is just stop energy, energy subsidies. So this poor guy in the Ministry of Finance that he wants to remain anonymous because if people would know, he would have a hard time walking in the street. Being the single responsible of how much the price went up, it usually goes up because they're trying to reduce subsidies. Instead of having, well, a free market of energy, yeah, if the oil goes up, the gasoline goes up. If the avocados go up, the guacamole goes up. So first difference, you don't have any options to the gas stations, then you have one single guy that determines the prices. Then you just have one single company doing, doing their, all the uh, refining of, of oil into gasoline, which is also Pemex. You have one single company doing all the exploration. You have one single company doing all the geological service. And this is part of the Mexican state, a key part of the Mexican state. So actually, we don't have an energy sector, we don't have a company, we have what it's legally called an entity of the public administration, which is called PEMS. It's not even a company, it doesn't behave like a company. And the big, one of the big challenges of the reform is making PEMS work as, as a normal uh, company. Then you have a union <coughs> which is basically embedded in the whole administration <coughs> of, of, the, of the institution. 
<laughs> Some of you must have heard of uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Could you raise your hand? You know, it was Jimmy Hoffa. Okay. Some of you have heard of Mobutu Seseko. <laughs> well, Mobutu Seseko was a, a statement in Africa, which is like a by, na by name of the most corrupt politician ever humanity has produced. <laughs> Well, the union leader in Mexico is a combination between Jimmy Hoffa and <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, As an anecdote, he, he sports uh, watches that are ten, twenty thousand dollars, and he shows it to the press, and he like brags about the half a million dollar Ferrari that his son has in his condo in Miami, and we have to put up with that, like monthly in the Mexican press. And this is the head of the union? That's the head of the union. Well, that makes 80,000 pesos a month. So $6,000 he can afford all that. And he used, his daughter used to have a Facebook page where you could follow her around the world buying luxury goods in different you know, capitals of the world. They got rid of that recently. Because they realized that wasn't good. <laughs> in her private jet with her dog. <laughs> it would be hard to do that, all of that without your dog. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was Nelson Rockefeller who said that the best business in the world was a well run oil company. And the second best business in the world is a badly run oil company. <laughs> well, what, what we are trying here to aim is to change all these things. But we haven't changed them since for the last 75 years for several reasons, some political, some economical. The, the issue, it's too, uh, it's too polluted by feelings more than by arguments. If, if you try to, with someone that disagrees with you in this perspective of what to do with the future of, of energy in Mexico, it's very possible that the debate will turn into emotions, feelings, more than evidence and, and, and data. Uh, I, I don't want to pass uh, judgment to, towards the, the US policy against owing bonds. But I will just share with you from the bottom of my heart, as a foreigner, it's a bit complicated to understand this relation of, of the American people between owing uh, guns and, and freedom. It's just hard to understand from, from an international perspective, of, of my personal perspective. Maybe, for a, I wonder, for a foreigner, foreigner, it's hard to understand why Mexicans have their national identity and their dignity so close to oil. I used to make a joke in, in presentations in Mexico that the last time I checked the Mexican flag, we have an eagle eating a, a snake and not a chemical compound of oil in the middle of the flag. <laughs> the joke didn't run very well, so I'd rather use it. Than <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's, a, that's, that's the way it is. So it's like trying to redesign the flag in the mind of so many people. And a debate that should be led by arguments, data, and evidence. It's led by uh, emotions, uh, the weight of history. It's, it's so bad how, how countries will cannot leave the past behind. And the president that designed more or less the current uh, energy sector, it's someone that was born in 1985, 1895. And he, he's kind of the guy the, the guy to, to sort it out. I, I, I was joking in an op-ed that we may, might need a Ouija board, you call it the Ouija, 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 Ouija board, <laughs> to communicate with Lazar Cárdenas in order to sort out what we need to do as a country. Uh, but that's, that's the way it is. And it's so relevant because energy represents just like 8% of the GDP. But it's basically the blood of the whole economy. <coughs> And imagine Mexico, it's the most integrated economy to the, to the world. And I, 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 I don't brag about it, it's, it's a fact. If you measure the number of free trade agreements we have, NAFTA, obviously, it's, it's the most important. US is our main trade partner. But we have trade agreements with Europe, we have trade agreements with Israel, we have trade agreements in, in all over South America. We are deeply integrated with more than, I think it's 40, 45 economies free trade, total trade. So imagine this economy which is looking to the world in all sectors with exception of the most important one, which is energy. 
So we have kind of, I, I was uh, saying this morning that more, more than policy wants to solve the, the Mexican energy uh, problem, we need like a shrink. <laughs> because we have this schizophrenic kind of relation between a very modern economy trying to integrate through export platform. And then this kind of, uh, uh, this part, this sector of the economy designed in the times of the import substitution model from the 60s or the 50s. So we have this kind of Soviet part of the Mexican economy with a state monopoly, no forbidden private investment, uh, forbidden private property, and then this rest of the economy that aims to be modern, aims to develop, aims to grow. And usually that kind of schizophrenic behavior doesn't work. Neither in people, neither in economies, and that's what we are going to change. Thank you very much.